Facecam, a new high-end webcam from Elgato, who has easily been one of the biggest benefactors of 2020, you know, with its focus on live streaming and tools have made remote work and communication easier and high quality. Now, what's interesting is that Facecam really fleshes out their lineup of camera options. They have Epoch Cam, which uses NDI technology, so you can use your Wi-Fi network and your smartphone as a video input. And I personally use this often for impromptu mobile cameras. There's the ever popular and previously impossible to find in stock Camlink 4K, which I've been using with my Fuji X-T3 and Sony a7S III cameras. And their fairly new Camlink Pro that you can put into a Windows PC through a PCIe slot and have four Camlink 4Ks in one without taking up a ton of your USB ports. This is awesome for multicam streaming, podcasts, and more. But Facecam sits in the spot before the Camlink 4K at about $200 and provides a bit of an all-in-one solution that is pretty easy to just plug in through USB 3.0 on Windows or Mac, which is nice to see. And then now you have a much better camera for live streams and video calls without the expense and complication of figuring out a more traditional camera. But of course, with the trade-offs that come with that. More on that later. Now, before we get to the rest of the video, if you are considering purchasing the face cam, please check out the links in the description as it does help support the channel. Let's talk about the hardware. For the actual guts and hardware of the face cam, it has a custom design prime lens, which means it has a fixed 24 millimeter focal length and can only digital zoom. 24 millimeters on a full frame camera is fairly wide. In fact, the lens that I'm using right now is a 24 millimeter lens and I can touch the camera from right here in front of me. Now, what is nice about the Elgato custom lenses is that it gives an 82 degree field of view without the cliche wide angle fisheye look that looks like this. It's not too flattering, right? Okay, I like that. It also has a f2.4 aperture, which means that it can let in a decent amount of light, making it perform solidly in low light. Kind of think of it as like your cat's eyes getting really, really Really big in low light, but kind of really slim in the daylight. Now, when you combine it with the Sony Stravis CMOS sensor, which is often used in low light security cameras, it really does perform extremely well in low light. Fun fact, Sony really makes almost all of the sensors out there outside of Canon for their own cameras. So, you know, if you have a smartphone or a security camera or an actual like mirrorless camera or something like that, it's a good chance that's made by Sony. Now, what's interesting is that this seems to do better in lower light than in tons of light. And unsurprisingly, it looks great with Elgato's key lights. I also found that the noise in the shadows doesn't really increase that much at lower light compared to a bright light, which is really nice to see. Now, one trade-off of having a fixed focal length and low aperture is that it has a limited focus distance. So a really low aperture is really helpful for achieving that really beautiful bokeh or portrait style image like this, but it means that only a shallow area is in focus while another is not. So you can see my hand over here is out of focus, but the camera itself is in focus. Facecam is set up to have everything between 12 inches to 47 inches in focus. Outside of that, it'll become blurry. In most situations, this is perfectly fine unless you're the kind of person that walks around your room a lot while on cam. Now, it's important to note that this does not have a microphone built into it since Elgato assumes that you'll be using another microphone option. Maybe like their Wave 3 mic, which is actually surprisingly convenient and I enjoy it quite a bit. Really, I think this is a good call because there's a good chance that a built-in microphone would not only sound bad, but it would add an additional cost to the camera, resulting in a higher price for you or more feature compromises in other areas. It's always that balance when you're making a product between price and features and it's always intention. Finally, it's 1080p, so not 4K, and it's capable of 60 frames per second, but it does not have HDR, which they shared was one of those trade-offs to keep the price down. That's a major bummer and that will be something I'll talk about in the big cons in a moment. Now as for build quality, it's definitely made out of plastic, but it doesn't feel particularly cheap. There's an LED that you can turn on and indicate when it's on and a lens cap that you can put in for privacy. There's a standard thread on the bottom with a rubber fitting that is compatible with most tripods or ball head mounts. And then a monitor mount so you can plop this thing on top of a monitor. I will say though that this doesn't quite fit as nicely on those super thin laptop displays though. Now one thing that you wanna keep in mind when you tighten this all the way, it's kind of interesting, you have to tighten the actual flat threaded base and then hold on to it and unscrew the rest of the mount. This misses an additional part to tighten against the rest of the mount so there's a risk that this could drift later on if it's not tightened all the way. Since it lacks it, you end up with this issue of tightening it all the way and have it not face straight ahead, but off to the side. But to be fair, so far it has been pretty tight and it isn't even drifting with it loosened, but I'm concerned about that for the long term. And all that could be fixed with Elgato's multi-mount, which is uh, unfortunately another cost to add to this, but is honestly an obvious and well-designed mounting solution. Now, one of the great things about the Elgato face cam is its software and ecosystem. With the available camera hub software, you can control a lot of different settings for the camera and a lot of it 
maintains the commonly known settings for cameras like shutter speed and ISO. Here, you can save one preset for your camera. You can adjust the field of view for the camera through digital zoom, which does lose some quality the more you zoom in, so keep that in mind. You can also adjust the picture style with contrast, saturation, which I like bumping up just a touch, and sharpness. Then you have exposure, which does have an automatic option that calculates its exposure under what it sees in the center of the image, where you're likely to be, right here, or the average of the whole image, which is what I prefer. Even in the automatic mode, you can adjust the compensation to get to the baseline brightness or darkness that you want. If you go manual, it's important to understand a few things. These are some tried and true settings that you should keep in mind. Whatever your frames per second are, you want to have your shutter speed at close to double that as possible. So if you're at 30 frames per second, you want to have a shutter speed of 1 over 64. And for 60 frames per second, you want to have 1 over 125. This gives it that traditional cinematic look. If you go higher, it can look a little bit hectic and choppy like an action scene. Maybe that's what you're going for. So, you know, you do you. But this is kind of the, the typical suggestion. For white balance, I'd say Elgato does a pretty good job of this if you have non-colored lights and they're all the same color temperature. And when you have that situation, you can set it to automatic. But if you want to, you can change how cool or warm looking the video is. Now, if you have something like my setup where you have multiple colored lights, some that are warmer and some that are cooler, some that are colored, well, you'll want to manually set up your color temperature. And then there's noise reduction, which you should just keep on. And of course, you can take photos with it. Now, ecosystems are great, and sometimes they really stink because they can kind of lock you into something. But when you're in that system, it's really nice. <laughs> it's kind of like what Apple does, right? But the face cam works really well with the Elgato Stream Deck, where you can set up custom keys to perform different actions, like reset to your default profile settings, zooming in in various increments, and other settings adjustments for contrast, saturation, sharpness, and compensation, which is how bright or dark you can make it. I know a lot of you are traveling a lot right now, and there's a little trick that you can do to save some money on travel and avoid paying more than you have to. Do. Depending on where you're located in the world, you can sometimes find a better rate for flights and other accommodations depending on where you're located. So to avoid getting ripped off, you should check out this video sponsor, NordVPN, which allows you to easily change where you're located on the internet. That tip could pay for a subscription just in travel savings alone. NordVPN is also helpful for crypto services and coins that may not be available where you're at. You can watch region block content on popular streaming websites. You can protect your data from being observed or compromised, especially if you're working remotely. NordVPN is an especially great option because it also has a kill switch to ensure your information is never exposed, even for a brief moment. I can also personally say that amongst all the other VPNs out there, NordVPN is the fastest one I've used, so you won't feel like your internet is being dragged down just for doing things the right way. And seriously, if you've been working remotely without a VPN this whole time, that's really bad. So fix that and get a ton of other benefits by going to nordvpn.com slash tech today, or click the link in the description to get 73% off the two-year plan with an initial four months for free on top of that. Now, beyond the cons I've already mentioned, there are some major negatives that make this thing perform terribly, but isn't something that cannot be overcome. First, because Facecam is designed to perform better in low light and doesn't support HDR, if you're choosing the 30 frames per second option with the 1 over 64 shutter speed, you'll get a pretty awfully blown out image if you use any traditional lighting like I'm using right now for video, or you turn up your key lights up all the way, or you're in a particularly bright area. So to fix that, you could break traditional camera standards and mess with your shutter speed to compensate for that, and HDR would have certainly helped tame the bright highlights of your face while still having enough detail in the shadows. Either way, you're limited on the bright end of things, which to be fair, is less likely to be an issue than, you know, you being in darker situations, which it handles well. And I think it just barely gets on the edge of being overexposed at 60 frames per second using the 1 over 124 shutter speed. Second, setting the exposure to automatic and leaving compensation at zero results in an overexposed image. You'll have to set it to negative 0.8 or more to make sure it's not overexposed. I personally prefer negative 1 and the metering set to average. Third, if the light hits it just right, you'll get a lens flare and a more washed out image. Now, this is typical of camera lenses in general, but you should keep that in mind since it seems to be pretty easy for it to happen in my setup, and I was quite surprised that that was the case. Fourth, I have these daylight tuned 57K Aperture 300D2 lights, and when I set it to 57K on the software, it actually looks really bad. If I set it to 47K, it looks right. So the color temperatures are off by 1000K, so I'm not sure if they carried the one improperly when coding this, but it seems awfully convenient for the color temperature to be off by exactly 1000K. Fifth, there's only one profile setting that can save on the face cam, which is stored locally on the camera itself. So that part is nice because you can carry it between computers. And to be fair, when we asked about having more profiles, they said it may be a possible consideration for additional profiles in the future. So at the end of the day, should you get it? Personally, it's nice to have, and I'll keep it because Elgato gave this to me for a review, but it wouldn't be the kind of product that I would go out and buy. That's not to say that it's a bad product. It's not. It's actually really great, and the image looks 
quite good for a webcam. It's just not for someone like me that knows how to use more complicated cameras, already has them, would buy them, prefers the quality and capability of them more, is a super big tryhard. <laughs> that in $200 is a good chunk of money that could go towards an entry level camera. Now, if you're someone that doesn't want to devote as many resources to your camera setup, either in terms of cost and equipment or learning how to use a camera, the Elgato Face Cam is a great option to just plug and play. It's easily in the top tier for webcam quality, but also has a high price tag that is a more justified price if you're using it to stream with and are already in the Elgato ecosystem. So if that's you, make sure to check out the links down below in the description to pick one up. Thanks for watching. This is Tech Today. Until next time.